Hey everyone, this is Teresa from Base 10 Montessori and today I thought I would start doing a review of The Absorbent Mind by Maria Montessori. So if you have that book at home and you want to reread it with me, I'm going to start with chapter one today and then I'm going to try each week to do a new chapter. And so you can read it along with me. You can decide what, co what kind of quotes inspire you or you can ask questions about what you've read and leave them in the comment section below and I'll try to work those into my video as well. So feel free to pick up your copy of The Absorbent Mind. And the reason why I am starting with this book is this really lays the foundation for the entire method that Maria Montessori came up with. And so if you're curious about her work, this tends to be where we start. Sometimes that's not easy because this book has some, has some thoughts in it that are a little bit foreign to how we think today or foreign to the language you, we use today. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, Maria Montessori was working in this field, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. So one, there's a little bit of um, a, a difference in how we talk today versus how we talked 100 years ago, right? And then also, uh, she primarily um, talked in Italian. That was her language, Italian. So the translations that come through from Italian into English are sometimes a little bit difficult to figure out what she's saying in English. So I think it's good to reread it and kind of see, work through that together, work through some of the dialogue together, and also be inspired together by what she was saying. Because I think you're going to find that what she was saying a hundred years ago really holds tr holds true to today. And not only that, we're really finding that science is, is just starting to prove everything that she said was true I I from a scientific point of view about development. So I think it's a really interesting book to go back and read. So that being said, um, what I'm going to do is I am going to... I'm just going to go through and pick out some of the quotes from chapter one that really inspired me. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to maybe make some comments on them and then you're free to make comments below and we'll try to start a, a dialogue or a discussion about what all of this means. So chapter one from The Absorbent Mind is called The Child's Part in World Reconstruction. So this is really the introduction to her method. And in chapter one, Maria Montessori wrote, today the world is in conflict and many plans are afoot for its future reconstruction. Education is widely regarded as one of the best means for bringing this about. For no one disputes that mankind, from the mental point of view, is far below the level that civilization claims to have reached. And if that resonated with you, it also resonated with me. We can really relate to the fact that the world is in conflict. It is still in conflict, and right now we're having a lot more discussions about where does education fit in all of this? Where do teachers fit in all this? And I think that's a big discussion that we're having right now. The next quote I really liked was, I do not doubt that philosophy and religion can bring to the task an immense contribution, but how numerous are the philosophers in this ultra civilized world? How many have there not been in the past and how many more will there not be in the future? Noble ideals and high standards we have always had. They form a great part of what we teach. Yet, Warfare and strife show no signs of abating, and if education is always to be conceived along the same antiquated lines of a mere transmission of knowledge, there is little to be hoped from it in the bettering of man's future. For what is the use of trans transmitting knowledge if the individual's total development lags behind? And I think that this is where we get into more of the holistic teaching, right? We're cultivating the spirit of the child. We're bringing about virtues and and character. And we're not just simply imparting knowledge on the child. We want the child to, to grow in every way and not just become smarter. And I think some of the arguments we're having along the way is what does that look like? Some people have very different ideas of what it's look like, of what it looks like to bring about the child's character and the child's personality. And so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of disagreement going on with that right now, but Maria Montessori believed in, in teaching to the whole child. And um, a lot of the work that we have in the room develops character, such as we only have, usually we only have one, one work in the room, like one, one of each work in the room, so that if a child wants to work with a material, he has to wait, and that develops the virtue of patience, right? I have to wait till somebody's finished with their turn. There aren't multiple of the same items except for, you know, things like pencils. Obviously we have a lot of pencils, but you know, the big, the bigger works, Let, let's say um, table scrubbing. 
a young child who wants to do table scrubbing, well, they can't get it out if somebody else is using it. So what do they have to do? First of all, they have to decide, well, I need to make another choice. First of all, what am I going to do while I wait? So not only do they have to practice patience, they have to also resolve that conflict inside themselves of how do I wait? Am I just going to do nothing or am I going to find a different work? Uh, and so children go about solving this problem in a lot of interesting ways that it's interesting to observe when the child has that conflict of waiting, what are they going to do? Um, it does get interesting. So if you ever get a chance to observe a Montessori room, look for that child who has to wait and see what they do, see what choices they're given or see what choices they're not given. That's kind of an interesting thing to think about when you're thinking about Montessori is that we're working really towards um, developing virtues and, and character and, and the will, developing the what Mon Maria Montessori says, developing the will of the child. The next thing I really liked uh, in chapter one was, was this quote, the first two years of life open new horizons before us, for here we may see the laws of psychic construction hitherto unknown. It is the child himself who presents us with these revelations. He brings to our knowledge a kind of psychic life totally different from that of adults. Here is the new path. No longer is it for the professor to apply psychology to childhood, but it is for the children themselves to reveal their psychology to those who study them. And so this is a really interesting thing. First of all, I'm going to pick up on that word psychic because it doesn't have the same connotation that we use it with in today's society. So this idea of the psychic construction, this um, psychic uh, energy that Maria Montessori talks about in Absorbent Mind is not um, based in, in a lot of um, religious type of a things or, or anything like that. So when we're talking about the word psychic in the Absorbent Mind, what we're really talking about are the mental organs. This was her reference to those me mental organs, the way that the mind operates in regards to the body, the type, the type of um, development and the type of process you see going on um, behind the muscles and the movement behind what you can actively observe. We know that there are things going on in the child's mind that we can't see. And so this is how she uses the word psychic. That's this energy that you can't see, this the mental organs you can't see. And when I talk about mental organs, for Maria Montessori, she talks about um, language as a mental organ, memory as a mental organ. And I'll get deeper into this when we actually get to the spiritual embryo or the psychic embryo, because there is a jap chapter dedicated to that. And I'll get deeper into that there, but just know when we talk about psychic, it's not it's not psychic in the way that we use that word currently. It's psychic in the form of what's going on with the mental development of the child, the emotional, that spiritual development, those developments that we can't see that have their roots more in the psychology versus the physical. So I just want you to keep in mind that when Maria Montessori talks about psychic, it's not uh, it's not in the same context as we talk about as far as psychics and mediums and all of that stuff in today's society. So keep that in mind. But also, um, I really like that last part of the quote that talks about the professor doesn't apply psychology to childhood, but the child reveals their psychology to the professor. And so it's this backwards thinking of the child is trying to reveal who they are to the adult and the adult needs to, to observe right? The, the adult needs to watch. The adult needs to learn from the child everything that the child has to offer instead of projecting onto the child. And so this is a different type of thought, isn't it? Not trying to diagnose the child so much as in observing and learning from the child. And that's really where we like to start as a guide. We like to start with, with that open mind of observation, that scientific process of, a, of coming in with that blank slate, not being biased, not trying to look for something that may or may not be there, but, but allowing ourselves to just observe the child in the environment, in context, and not see anything more into it than what they show us, and then learn something from what they show us. So it's really kind of this reverse of, of what we do in current society. Even still, we haven't really learned our lesson, I think, in that area, because we're still trying to do this backwards. We're really trying to figure out the child from the terms of what we know instead of learning from the child from what we see. So we kind of have to reverse our methods there. And, and it's not an easy thing to do. And we're constantly practicing. We are constantly practicing that as Montessori guides. And then there's this quote. There is, so to speak, in every child, a painstaking teacher so skillful 
that he obtains identical results in all children in all parts of the world. The only language men ever speak perfectly is the one they learn in babyhood, when no one can teach them anything. Not only this, but if at a later age the child has to learn another language, no expert help will, will enable him to speak to speak it with the same perfection as he does his first. So that's kind of a mind-blowing thought, first of all. Um, and Maria's, Maria Montessori talks a lot about language. And so, again, that's something that I'll get into in other chapters a little more deeply. But uh, Maria Montessori talks about this painstaking teacher, and we call that the inner teacher, that there's this inner teacher that that is that is communicating with the child between the ages of zero to six. The child is following this path of nature. Then there's an inner teacher that's speaking to the child that says, you must learn this now. You must do this now. You must develop this now. And it's not based on the rules of the adult, right? It's not based on what we know, but what nature is telling the child to do. And so that inner teacher is what she's talking about right here. That inner teacher um, calls to the child and has him naturally develop these skills. And then, of course, she gets into how amazing it is that a child can learn learn language so proficiently between the ages of zero to six that there is no time of life where you can absorb language the way we do in between the ages of zero to six. And it really is an incredible thing to think about. And then this says, by the age of three, the child has already laid down the foundations of his personality as a human being. And only then does he need the help of a special scholastic influences. So great are the conquests he has made that one may well say, the child who goes to school at three is already a little man. Psychologists have often affirmed that if our own adult ability be compared with the child's, we should need 60 years of hard work to do what he does in three. Yet he is still far from having exhausted the strange power that he possesses of absorption from his surroundings. And that's pretty amazing to think that what a child can do by the age of three <laughs> How long would it take us as an adult? And she says, well, we would need 60 years to do what a child can do in three. And that's true, right? The absorbent mind is an amazing thing. And it only happens between the ages of zero to six, what they can pick up on. And as adults, we do not have the ability that a child has to learn and adapt to their surroundings. So it's an amazing observation that she made about about the human mind right there. And she goes on to say, in our first schools, the children used to enter when three years old. No one could teach them because they were not receptive. Yet they offered us amazing revelations of the greatness of the human soul. Ours was a house for children rather than a real school. We had prepared a place for children where a diffused culture could be assimilated from the environment without any need for direct instruction. That's pretty cool, right? We're not looking at this direct instruction approach in Montessori. The children who came were from the humblest social levels, and their parents were illiterate. Yet these children learned to read and write before they were five, and no one had given them any lessons. So when we talk about the Montessori method, we're talking about the guide being a link to the materials. We're showing a presentation. We're presenting to the child what they can do. And then they're watching us. And then they see what we are doing. They see us modeling for them what they're supposed to do. And their minds pick up on it. We don't have to tell them. We don't have to direct them. We simply have to present it. And then we have to move out of their way as a guide. We're not there to teach them. We're there to link them. Link them to the environment. Link them to the materials. And then it's not about us as the adult. It's not about our thoughts. It's not about what we're thinking. It's not about what we want to get across to the child. It's about preparing the environment. It's about preparing the lesson. Showing it to them. Presenting it to them. And then moving back. Because there's a far greater teacher than the human going on in that room. And that's that inner teacher that the child has. The child will learn because they must learn it because that is part of their nature is to learn. And we must simply provide a place where they can absorb it and perfect it. The press began to speak of culture acquired spontaneously. Psychologists wondered if these children were somehow different from others. And we ourselves puzzled over it for a long time. Only after repeated experiment to repeated experiments did we conclude with certainty that all children are endowed with this capacity to absorb culture. So this isn't just a limited experience that she had. She went all over the world. She went to India. She went all over Europe. She brought it to the United States. She went everywhere and started different programs and she found universal truths in her methods. So 
this has been going on for now over a hundred years, right? We've been doing Montessori for a long time. We have a lot of data to be gathered and we're finding this is still true. Um, and we're finding out as teachers just how much the traditional methods, the ones that we're still trying to put in public schools, don't really work. They don't work as well as the Montessori method. And uh, just to give you a little insight, you know, I can teach my kindergartners division into the millions. I can teach them dynamic addition, subtraction, multiplication, static and dynamic, and all the operations. And by the time they're in kindergarten, they've had that. And and they're reading and they are um, diagramming sentences and they're learning through um, a sensorial, they're learning sensorially, getting a sensorial impression of, of grammar uh, by the time they're in kindergarten. So we're still finding these things to be true, what they're capable of. It's just our methods need to change if we want the child to, to get to that level. It's not so much that the child can't do it. It's just that the adult needs to change how they relate to the child. And so we discovered that education is not something which the teacher does, but that it is a natural process which develops spontaneously in the human being. It is not acquired by listening to words, but in virtue of experiences in which the child acts on his environment. The teacher's task is not to talk, but to prepare and arrange a series of motives for cultural activity in a special environment made for the child. So again, the emphasis is not going to be on the teacher. The teacher must prepare herself for himself. They must prepare the environment. But it's not about getting across knowledge, transferring it from the teacher to the child. It is simply about the teacher preparing himself or herself to present what needs to be acquired and then moving out of their way. We teachers can only help the work going on as servants wait upon a master. We then become witnesses to the, to the development of the human soul, the emergence of the new man who will no longer be the victim of events, but thanks to his clarity of vision, will become able to direct and to mold the future of mankind. I think that that is an idea that gets lost in, in teaching today. This idea of being a servant to the child is one that not every teacher shares, but it is important because that humility is the first step in teaching according to Montessori, preparing your yourself, preparing your spirit, pr preparing your body and serving the child is more important than than anything. It's the first step. And if you can't do that, then you know, it, it becomes an obstacle for the child's learning. That is all I have for you at the moment. And I really hope that you enjoyed some of these quotes. I hope you liked this content. If you did, give it um, a thumbs up, share it. Uh, also comment below. I'll see you in the next video or maybe the, the next live stream.